Hey everybody, Canadian Operator here. I'm uh, going to be filming outside today because the weather's quite nice. But uh, as you might recall, I, uh, I had a poll for you guys uh, not too long ago and I kind of wanted to know whether the next video you wanted to see more of a gear review video or whether you wanted to see something along the lines of a training video. And a lot of you uh, responded, uh, well, a lot of you responded, period. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for doing that. Uh, I appreciate that. I think we got well over 40 votes on that. So that's really nice to see everybody getting engaged. And I'm always happy to uh, to do what I can to bring you guys some good uh, some good videos. So that being said, uh, it looks like uh, gear review was really close, but it didn't win. Uh, we got the training video that won. So that's what we're doing today. And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about how to apply for your firearms license in Canada. Now, I've done a lot of other videos uh, in this kind of area uh, a little bit earlier on. So a couple of weeks ago, I did some videos and we talked about things like classification. Uh, we talked about uh, different types of firearms, different types of firearm licenses, kind of what you need to do uh, before you get to the point of applying. So in this video, what we're going to be talking about is basically how to apply for your Canadian firearms uh, or how to, for your firearms license, I should say, um, as opposed to, you know, all the stuff that you have to do before, which is, you know, do some research, uh, find a CFSC or CFR, uh, CFRSC, any firearms, Canadian CRFSC, I'm sorry, really getting bad with this. Um, so the, the Canadian uh, Firearm Safety Course, Canadian Restricted Firearm Safety Course, uh, of course, you need to do at least the, the, the minimum is the, the Canadian Firearm Safety Course. That's going to be for your long guns, shotguns, rifles, etc. Uh, namely for your non-restricted firearms. Now what you can do, and you, you can save yourself a lot of time, and again we'll, we'll explain this as we kind of go through the video. I want to go through uh, really the, the entire application here with you. I know this seems like a lot, um, but it's really going to be a lot of information for you who is just brand new to applying for this. And listen, even if you're applying for a restricted license, you know, you might not have done this for quite some time some things may have changed right so uh, gr grab yourself a drink grab yourself some snacks maybe uh, sit down and relax and enjoy so the first thing that we need to talk about is whether you're going to be applying for your uh, Canadian uh, your, your PAL your regular PAL possession acquisition license or your restricted PAL there's not going to be a massive difference really between the two the only being, of course, that for your PAL, you need your CFSC, your Canadian Firearm Safety Course. For your RPAL, your Restricted PAL, you need your Canadian Restricted Firearm Safety Course. For those of you who are wondering, can I do both of these in the same weekend? Uh, yes, you can. Generally speaking, uh, and you know the, the instructor that I did it with uh, often likes to do it in a weekend. Of course, those dates filled up really, really quickly, and I wasn't able to do it in a weekend myself. So I had to do my, my regular course first. And then about uh, 8 to 12 months later, I did my second course and uh, I got my restricted license the same, right? The same way that anybody else would do it. Uh, my courses were just a little bit further apart. But that being said, that's the first thing that you kind of need to know. The second thing uh, I think that I would recommend to everybody, and, and if you're going to just stop watching the video here because you don't want to go through all of the steps and go through you know the application one by one kind of thing, and I'll, I'll try to throw the application up on the screen here too so, for, so you can kind of see it instead of me just kind of dangling it out here in front of you. Um, but the important thing is you really ought to read the, uh, the information on the application. There's about four, let me see here. I think there's about four different uh, sheets. So there's one, two, three, and yeah. So there's like half the application is just information on how to fill out the application. The reason why the majority of people don't get their licenses right away, they don't get their licenses as quick as they want to. Uh, of course, COVID was a thing. That's when I applied in uh, 2021. COVID was still kind of a thing. And so for that reason, that was a bit slower. But my application was complete, and if it wasn't, I would have to wait much, much longer for those things to happen. So it's imperative that if you don't want to go through the rigmarole uh, any more than you need to, because let's be honest, you're going to need to. <laughs> the government is not exactly making this easy. Um, but that being said, if you want to streamline your process and you want to get better uh, at, uh, or you want to get good, I should say, <laughs> at making sure that when you submit your application, everything's going to be done, you need to read the first four pages of this application. It's important, okay? Because it gives you things like where you're going to send the application. That's arguably probably the most important thing. But also things like what you need to fill out, what you need to include, what you don't need to include uh, in terms of your photo, the dimensions of the photo that you need to include as well, what you need to have accompanying that photo, and a variety of other things. And so it's important for you to know that because if you don't, 
if you make a mistake or several mistakes, the guys in Miramachi are not gonna be fixing those mistakes for you. They're gonna be calling you, probably emailing you or whatever, and saying, hey, we've got this incomplete application here. We need X, Y, Z. And then that's just gonna prolong the process, right? So let's start talking about sort of the, the first part of the application. We'll go through it little by little. I'll try to provide you a little bit of insight and information uh, as to how I filled it out and how I was uh, on two different occasions able to successfully complete my application and successfully got my PAL and now my RPAL. All right, so page one of your application uh, is gonna look something like this, although uh, I'll see if I can maybe put that up on the screen for you so that you can see it and we'll, we'll kind of zoom in on it and we'll go uh, step by step. So the first thing is license information. So they want to know whether you're a brand new applicant, they wanna know whether you have applied before, uh, and there's a few of the questions in there that are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, if you are applying for the first time, obviously, you know, uh, you're applying either for your PAL or your RPAL if you did it in one weekend. And if you are uh, someone who's already licensed and you want to renew your license, this is not the application that you need. They have uh, the option to renew on the Canadian Firearms Program website, the individual web services. I'll uh, see if I can link to that as well in the description below the video. So if all you're looking for uh, is just to renew your license, you don't need any of this. Uh, you can just do this online and it's pretty simple. Uh, and if you're looking for other services as well, such as uh, if you want to register uh, a firearm that is restricted, if you want to uh, have a reference number generated for the sale or the purchase, uh, or I suppose it would be the sale, it would be the, the person who's selling it to do this, uh, of a non-restricted firearm, again, this is something you can do on the website, okay? So uh, the first section here, all we're looking at is we need to find out what license you're applying for, what licenses you want, and then if you're currently licensed, some information about that, including your license number and so on. So that's pretty straightforward. Moving on to section number two, it's gonna be personal information. So again, things like you know your name, uh, your address, date of birth, phone number, things like that. Ways for them to be able to get in touch with you. And this is also very important because if there is anything that they need to talk to you about with respect to the application, they need to be able to get a hold of you, right? If, if they can't get a hold of you, then your application might be in limbo and you'll just be waiting for months and months and months and you'll never know what's going on with your application. So page number one is pretty easy. Uh, let's move on to page number two. All right, so page number two, again, uh, it, it can be fairly straightforward, but it, it depends on your situation. Uh, the first thing is your personal history. So they're gonna be asking you questions like, have you ever been charged, convicted of any kind of offense? Have you ever been the subject of a peace bond? A peace bond is generally uh, somebody that goes to the justice of the peace and says, hey, I think that guy is dangerous. Uh, here's reason X, Y, and Z, why I wanna be far away from this guy as, as far as possible. Uh, can I get a peace bond to make sure that happens? That's not the same as a restraining order. A restraining order is different, but there is uh, a question here with respect to family violence, things like that, um, w which they ask as well. There's also a question about, you know, have you ever been diagnosed with anything like, you know, any kind of mental health stuff? So they're talking about things like anxiety, depression, PTSD, schizophrenia, dementia, any anything like that. Um, and this is the, the first part that I think I really need to add a little bit of detail. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, back in 2018, I was in a pretty severe, pretty serious motorcycle accident that almost ended my life. Uh, and uh, it was through no fault of my own. I was uh, riding safely and somebody else wasn't paying attention. They wanted to uh, get through a light and they basically just hit me. As a result, uh, you know, long story short, I was in the hospital for about half a month. I wasn't able to walk for three months and I wasn't able to walk well for six months. Um, and I was basically bedridden for almost half a year. It was quite bad. Uh, there was a lot of recovery physically, but there was a lot of recovery uh, emotionally as well. And uh, in, emotionally and from, from the mental health perspective, I still haven't fully recovered. I still deal with episodes uh, of depression. I still deal with episodes of anxiety, uh, really severe anxiety and PTSD, issues with sleep and you know all these other things. Now, mind you, I'm at the stage of my treatment where I'm able to maintain and um, sort of deal with these symptoms as they come up. And this, this has been through just years of following up with my doctors, my therapists, you know, ongoing therapy and treatment and stuff like that. So I'm in a place now where I know very much about what my issues are and how, I, how to deal with them. But uh, when I was applying for my firearms license, I really wasn't at this kind of polished level of like, how do I mitigate my symptoms? How do I deal with my symptoms? Um, how far reaching are my symptoms? How do they affect my life? And, um, you know, I was really worried when I was applying for this. 
uh, that if I was going to say yes to have I ever been diagnosed with a mental health condition or anything like that, uh, that I would never get my firearms license. And uh, I knew that I've never had a criminal history or anything like that. I've never, you know, um, had any issues of that sort. And so uh, I decided, you know what, I'm going to be honest. And in this case, if I could give you any kind of advice, it would be that you are honest as well. The reason for this is because, for one, it shows them that well, that you're an honest person, which is a huge thing, especially when you're applying to uh, possess, acquire, uh, and store and own firearms, right? That's, that's kind of a big deal, especially in Canada. Um, but it also shows them that you're taking ownership of the situation, um, that you have an understanding of the fact that you do have an issue. And it also shows them potentially that you're also exploring ways of finding a way to get help uh, and, and mitigating your symptoms at the very least or correcting them at the very best, right? Um, and so when the chief firearms officer or one of the, one of the uh, officers that reviewing the application looks at that uh, and they say, okay, this person's, you know, been, uh, let's say, diagnosed with, uh, you know, depression, let's just say, right, just for argument's sake, you can attach another sheet to write a letter and explain what that is. There's not going to be enough place on the actual application to talk about this, but I encourage you, if you feel comfortable, to do that in an additional piece of documentation, whatever that might be, right? Could be a letter from your doctor, could be just a personal letter you explaining things like, hey, you know, I've been diagnosed with X, Y, and Z, but here's what I'm doing about it. I'm, you know, and in this case, uh, what happened with me is that with my first application for my PAL, uh, I actually got contacted by the chief firearms officer and they said, hey, um, you know, you've, you've indicated such, so we need to get more information about your medical history. So they sent additional forms. I had to go to my doctor and yes, I'm not going to lie to you. It was a pain in the ass to go to my doctor and have all this stuff filled out. My doctor was thankfully uh, very good about it. And, you know, he uh, he worked with me to to kind of make sure that they got all the information that they needed. But what that shows, again, is competence on your level, on your uh, part in taking ownership and and f basically making sure that you are taking care of yourself. That's what they want to know. So the more honest, the more transparent and upfront you can be about this, the better it's going to be for you. And to be honest, the easier the job you're going to be making for them because they're going to realize that you're somebody who cares about your own well-being and the well-being of other people. And this is a, a fundamental trait, I think, that every firearms owner should have, right? So I know that's a little bit excessive maybe in the explanation, but, you know, don't be shy. Don't be apprehensive. This is information you need to provide. You have to be honest. If you can't be honest in this application, I would much rather for you not to apply than for you to apply and not be 100% honest, right? Um, so the next part is going to be conjugal status uh, and information about your conjugal partner. Conjugal doesn't mean uh, necessarily that you have to be married, that you have to be engaged, anything like that. It could be boyfriend or girlfriend, could be, you know, your spouse, uh, it could be your husband, your wife. It could be your fiance, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, if you have a conjugal relationship with somebody, you need to disclose that here. And on the next page, we're going to look at former conjugal relationships as well. The reason for this is uh, under the area of sort of the whole domestic violence situation, right? They want, to, uh, they want to make sure that the other person in the house is aware that you're getting firearms, right? That your partner is aware. Now, they don't need, uh, they're, they're going to need a signature here or they're, they're going to ask for a signature. They don't actually need one, but they're going to ask for a signature from your conjugal partner, as well as information about them, their name, their date of birth, you know, uh, where they're living kind of thing, uh, their, their phone number probably as well here. And so they're going to want to follow up with that person because that's the law. So there's two options that you have in this regard. You can leave all of this blank, right? And that that's not something that I would recommend if you do have a conjugal partner, right? Um, I, I guess I should say there's three options, right? One is you could just be completely dishonest, which again, I would not recommend at all. Uh, the second option is, of course, you can put your conjugal partner's information in there, uh, but not get them to sign. Uh, and then the third option is you could put your, your conjugal partner's information in there and have them sign and date the application. Okay, the, the signing and the dating, it's not uh, permission for you to go and apply to get a license. Okay, uh, the, the firearms program doesn't need your conjugal partner's decision or, or approval or anything or permission or anything like that. Um, the whole idea here is that they're aware. All right, they want to make sure that they're aware um, because they don't know, right? It might be a peaceful, loving, lasting relationship that's never had an issue outside of a mild, you know, uh, verbal argument here and there, which happens to everybody, right? Um, or 
It might be a, a domestic violence situation where the person is being abused and they're too afraid to leave. And now their partner is applying for, you know, uh, for a firearms permit, for a license, right? So it could be either of those or anywhere in between. And the guys that are reviewing this information don't know that, right? Um, so what they're asking for is inform your conjugal partner. That's all it is. It's just, I, we want them to know. So the two ways that they go about doing this is either they have the informed uh, in sort of uh, signature of the conjugal partner on the application that they know that their partner is applying for a PAL. Or if they don't have that, then they're obligated by law to contact that person and say, by the way, your partner is applying for a PAL. And here's the number for the Canadian Firearms Program, which I'll link down below, uh, which if you have any kind of spousal, you know, uh, violence or abuse or any kind of report like that to make about the person who's either applying for or already has a firearms license, call this number, talk to us. And there's protocols in place to deal with that, okay? All right, so the next page, we're gonna start with a former conjugal partner. So if you don't currently have a conjugal partner, or maybe you do, but you had a, a former conjugal partner that falls under the definition of that, which again, you'll find on the actual application. If you, you know, read the questions, it'll tell you, this is what we mean by former conjugal partner. So if you have someone that was a former partner of yours that was a conjugal partner, then you know this, this is where you would add their information as well. Uh, the next part here is gonna be training, right? So um, as we discussed in one of my previous videos, one of the things that you need to do in order to apply for a PAL before you can even apply for one is you need to go through the Canadian Firearm Safety Course for your PAL or the Canadian Restricted Firearm Safety Course for your RPAL or your Restricted PAL. Those are the two different licenses that you need uh, broadly speaking for the two main different types of classifications of firearms in Canada, okay? Uh, so what you're gonna need to put in here is you're gonna need to put uh, the dates and locations of any of the relevant trainings that you've had. So if you've had a CFSC, you can put, okay, I, I took my Canadian Firearm Safety course. Uh, this was the date and location that I took it. And most importantly, you're going to have to include your course materials, your course uh, report. Okay, so generally what happens when you take your CFSC, you wait about uh, four to six weeks on average. For some people it's less, for some people it's more. Right? So that's why we say it's on average uh, to get your course report from your, your course, whatever course you happen to take, okay? And you need to include a copy of that course report um, and if, if I'm not mistaken, actually even the original. So you can make a copy for yourself, include the original course report with your application. And they need to see that. They need to see that you've passed your written test at 80% or above, your practical test, again, at 80% or above, okay? Uh, so you need to include that information alongside your application, and then you need to fill out that uh, area there to, to show them, hey, I've completed these courses, this is when and where I've completed them, and yes, I've attached stuff or no, I don't have it yet. And if you don't have it yet, I would really recommend you wait uh, to apply because you're gonna have experience uh, delays in your application, okay? Uh, the last thing is going to be your references, okay? So you have, uh, I believe, two different references. Let me just double check here because it kind of bleeds over to the next page. Yeah, you've got two different ref references there, okay? Um, the references uh, cannot be your conjugal partner. Your conjugal partner can be your photo guarantor. Canadian Firearms Program has been uh, I think lacking in this department in, in that they haven't called every single reference. Um, and I, I feel like that might be even be a far cry because from what I've heard, they're, they're only calling, you know, 10 to 15% of references. And as a firearms owner, um, you know, I understand that this process can be quite long, but I want them to call my references <laughs> because I want them to know that I am capable and, and you know, I'm a prudent person, a responsible person to carry, possess, store, use firearms, right? So, in any case, that's what you need. Uh, you're gonna have one reference on uh, the bottom of that page, and then you're gonna have another reference on the top of the next page. Okay, uh, so the next thing is you're gonna need a photo guarantor, and that's gonna be somebody that's gonna saying, hey, I know this person, this photo is a true likeness of that person, and uh, that's that's basically what they need, right? That can be your conjugal partner. They need to know you for at least one year, and they need to be uh, age of majority, basically 18 years old or up, okay? So that that's your photo guarantor. Uh, the next thing is your fees. Uh, as with anything government, of course, fees are gonna be a thing. Uh, so you, you can you know, put your credit card information there. If you're comfortable, you can put a check, what have you. There's a, there's a number of different ways you can pay. Um, but that, that section is fairly straightforward. You fill out your information, you fill out your preferred method of payment, uh, and then, uh, then you can uh, just 
you know, su submit it on your application, whatever it might be. Um, I went personally with credit card, uh, you know, never really a big deal with that. I, you know, I trust my bank uh, and I've had a really good relationship with my bank with respect to stopping any kind of fraud and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I'm comfortable with that. So I provided my credit card number on the application, sent it off to Miramachi and and that was good. My credit card got charged. And in fact, if you do it with a credit card, um, the cool thing about that is when your credit card gets charged, it's almost like a status update on your application, isn't it? Right? Because you're like, holy crap, they took my money. <laughs> right? Like you look at your credit card statement and, and you see RCMP and you're like, okay, this is good. You know, things are moving along. So that's kind of uh, what made my day is, you know, I didn't really know what the status of my application was. It was still relatively early. I think it was only just a couple of weeks or whatever, uh, two or three weeks, I think it was. And then, you know, I saw that charge on my credit card statement. Then I was like, okay, all right, things are moving along. So speaking of moving along, let's move along to the next page. All right, so the last page is uh, arguably the simplest of them all. It just requires your signature uh, and a date. And that's just basically your declaration. The information I've provided here is accurate to my knowledge, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just make sure to read that. It's just there's a little statement on the bottom there. Uh, and then just go ahead and sign in date. And then uh, you, you want to make sure that, of course, you enclose whatever payment method you enclosed. You want to make sure you enclose your photo uh, properly signed, the right dimensions and all this kind of stuff. You want to make sure you uh, attach your course notes and your course report you want to make sure you also attach any additional information you wanted to supply whether that was about your personal information whether that was about your personal history any additional information about your references that you want to add whatever you want to add that you can always uh, add in an extra page um, but if there's anything that I'm missing feel free to let me know below uh, as well just again double or triple check uh, you know the the information sheet on the front of the application it is a pain in the ass trust me I know this to go through four pages of info sheets but the last thing you want to do is you want to wait four weeks, five weeks, and then find out that your application is not complete. And worst case scenario, uh, have to reapply altogether. Best case scenario, probably have to amend the application by sending further information, which is just going to take more time, right? So save yourself the hassle. Take it from me. Uh, you know, uh, just do everything ahead of time that you can follow all the instructions. They even have a checklist, I believe, uh, that you can follow and you can kind of check things off and make sure that you've included everything that you needed to include. All right, so that being said, that is uh, basically uh, the Canadian Firearms application uh, for your uh, PAL, your possession acquisition or your possession or uh, restricted possession acquisition license. Um, it is definitely a little bit involved, uh, but again, if you go through and read everything and you provide clear, concise answers, supporting documentation, everything like that, there should be no issues for you uh, to, to get your PAL. Of course, other than if there's, you know, an issue with respect to criminal justice or abuse or, you know, anything like that or, you know, um, there could be hiccups there, right? Uh, if, if you've been through those situations, but again, uh, the best, the best scenario here is, you know, just be honest, right? They, the last thing they want to do, I, th I think they would prefer for you to have some history and to be honest about it, whatever that history might be, uh, than to be dishonest or not tell the whole truth, which is just as good as being dishonest, right? Them finding out and then realizing that you weren't honest with them, right? At that point, now you've, compromise the level of trust that you may have initially had with them and as you're probably aware you know trust it's it's built it's not given so uh don't compromise that that little bit of trust that you do have submit your application wholly you know be uh as honest and transparent as you can and they will work with you to the best of their ability they're they're pretty good over there okay so that's going to be it. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know down below. Make sure to become a subscriber of the channel and uh, leave me a like here if this has helped you out in some way. Uh, if you happen to be watching this after uh, we've become a partner on YouTube, there might also be a super thanks button under the video. We're actually really close to that. And I just uh, wanted to thank you guys again uh, for, for helping to grow this channel as much as you have. It really does make a big difference to me. And uh, seeing all the comments, the kind words, uh, the support, all the folks coming into the Discord as well, which the link for that will be in the description is really nice because we get to kind of uh, shoot the shit for lack of better words with people from all over the world uh, we've got people from the UK Canada US uh, Britain uh, India you know all over the world Australia uh, and we get we kind of get an idea of like what all the different 
world firearms laws are, you know, in all the different countries and stuff like that. Uh, it, it really is a really great environment. So if you haven't already, come down and join us on Discord. And uh, that's going to be it for me, everybody. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate you being here and uh, taking this time with me. I realize the video may have been uh, maybe not as uh, fun or entertaining as uh, some of my other videos are. But uh, if you're brand new to the firearms world here, then welcome. Uh, you're joining a really amazing community of some really incredible people. Uh, and uh, we're glad to have you. So uh, this is what we need. We just need to continue to educate uh, the rest of our Canadian friends uh, to, uh, to let them know what it's like to own a firearm, even if they don't want to own one. And uh, that's how we're going to make things better for everybody. Okay, thanks for watching, everybody. Appreciate your time. This has been literally the most long-winded outro ever. But I appreciate you very, very much. And I'll see you next time. Bye for now.